Thank you, Kim, for the introduction, um, and to the ASLO Awards Committee and for all of you for being here today. I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about small ponds, because I think these ponds are underdogs in limnology. And so to have an audience full of limnologists, I can convince you of their ecological and biogeochemical significance. I've been studying small ponds for over 10 years, since I was an undergraduate. And we know a lot about ponds in terms of the, their ecological communities and that they are biodiversity hotspots across the region. And indeed, what initially hooked me into looking at ponds was this charismatic, not so megafauna, the spotted salamander. And that was what I did as an undergraduate, looking at their habitat use and their demography. And I then proceeded to do my master's, and especially during my PhD, began to realize that these lovely amphibians are just one component of these ecosystems. And I began to ask questions related to energy flow and food web structure, which is one of the reasons I'm so honored to be receiving the Lindemann Award, because Raymond Lindemann's seminal paper, The Trophic Dynamic Aspect of Ecology, has been really influential in my research, uh, especially his famous what he called a food cycle, or what we refer to as food webs. And what I love about this is how, I'm not sure if I have the laser pointer, but right in the center, he puts ooze. And I just love that term, ooze, and the fact that he focused on that non-living component and the interactions of the dead and the living matter of, of bogs, but of inland waters. And he actually said that the Discrimination between living components of a system and non-living components is arbitrary and unnatural. And that really influenced my thinking when I was studying these small ponds and thinking about that ooze and what is contributing to the ooze and how important that is to the food web. Now, if you look at this picture, you can see that in small systems, they have a very large edge effect relative to larger lakes. And they can receive significant amounts of terrestrial input, such as leaf litter, that decomposes and the bacteria start to get to work and contributes to that ooze. And I was really interested in thinking about that in terms of the importance of terrestrial versus aquatic resources to a food web. And when I started my PhD at Yale, I began shopping these ideas around and ended up having a lot of conversations with Pete Raymond, who I think is here somewhere. Um, and he, if you know Pete, he's an amazing ecosystem ecologist, a biogeochemist, and he loves carbon. And so as we started talking about these ponds, we sort of came up with this idea that these ponds could have a really unique carbon cycle, really unique biogeochemistry because of all of these terrestrial inputs that are coming into them. And more for Pete's sake than my own at first, I began doing gas sampling in these ponds. And I'm really glad I did. I didn't know that it would lead to half of my dissertation focusing on biogeochemistry. Uh, but it's been a great path. And as any kind of surprising results are, it got me really excited in figuring out what's going on in these ponds. And so I ended up designing a study that looked at six of these small ponds across two years, looking at carbon dioxide and methane every two weeks from when the ice came off the ponds until when the ponds dried. These were temporary systems. And the short story is that when we looked at carbon dioxide, um, we found that they were on average 19 times supersaturated compared to the atmosphere. And we thought that was really high, and indeed it is among some of the highest concentrations reported for inland waters around the globe, uh, including some of those northern latitude sites, and these were ponds in Connecticut. And then we looked at methane, and we found that on average they're 500 times supersaturated compared to the atmosphere, which is extremely high. And so this is potentially indicative of really high emissions. So there's all this decomposition happening in the pond, the water is full of the carbon, and it could potentially be emitting to the atmosphere. And so we asked this question, do small ponds matter to the global carbon cycle? And to answer this question, we first compiled a database from the literature where I looked for studies that had measured carbon dioxide and or methane directly from inland waters around the globe. And we were able to compile 427 sites that ranged in size from a small puddle up to Japan's largest freshwater lake at 674 square kilometers. And we then grouped these lakes and ponds into size classes, which is what um, had been done in the past. In fact, Pete had authored a paper on this, on this question, but hadn't included the really small ponds. 
And so we grouped them into these logarithmic size classes, and then we assigned them all a gas exchange rate, or K600, which basically is just how quickly gases can move from the water to the air, which increases with lake size. Because if you imagine that picture I showed you of the small pond, it's very sheltered. There's not a lot of turbulence. There are no waves. Uh, it's sheltered from the wind, so gas exchange rates are lower than a big lake where there's wave action and turbulence. And we then needed to figure out the surface area of all of these lakes and ponds worldwide. Now that was really easy for, the, for me, for the larger size classes, because a paper had just come out, uh, the Verpooter paper, that looked at the surface area of lakes and ponds around the world that were 2,000 square meters and up. But there were none of these ponds because they're hard to find on satellite images. There's a lot of error. Um, maybe Igor and Claudia can help us out with that. Uh, and so in order to fill this gap, what we did was we um, well, this is just an image of one of my ponds that you can see that it's very hard to tell if that's a shadow, if that's a pond, um, if there's water there. And the field site, the field station is at the top of that picture for, for scale. That's about a 500 square meter pond. And so it's hard to scale up. And so what we did, it's not perfect, but we decided to focus on a lower and an upper bound. So to get that lower bound number, we just took a log-log relationship from the Verpruder study to get what we felt confident was a lower bound estimate, because we know that there are actually a lot more ponds um, as you go down in size, uh, but they are small, so they don't maybe make up as much in terms of their global surface area. And then we took John Downing's estimate of 3.2 billion small ponds that's based off of a Pareto distribution which folks have said is an upper bound estimate because we know the Pareto distribution doesn't work in mountainous regions. So we have this lower bound and an upper bound estimate. We're probably somewhere in the middle. Regardless of which number, I do want to emphasize the fact that this is over 95% of all lakes and ponds by number in the world. And it's about 9% of all lakes and ponds by surface area. And so we now have our concentrations that we gathered through that meta-analysis database the gas exchange rates, and the surface area. And what we did was a Monte Carlo analysis that allowed for uncertainty in both the greenhouse gas concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane, as well as uncertainty in that lowest size class, those new ponds that are 1,000 square meters and lower. And we scaled up to the world. So a lot of uncertainty is now being encountered. Uh, and what we found was that total carbon emissions are just shy of 0.6 petagrams of carbon per year. That's about 5% of global emissions on an annual time scale, and in line with some of the previous estimates. And what you can see is that about 98% of that is coming from carbon dioxide. However, if you think about carbon dioxide and methane in terms of equivalent greenhouse gas warming potential, we know methane's a more potent greenhouse gas, and so methane is actually accounting for about 28% of the greenhouse gas potential. Now, the purpose of our study was to figure out these really small ponds that had been previously ignored in all of the published estimates of inland waters in the carbon cycle. And what we find, again, is they're about 9% of global surface area. And they make up 15% about of carbon dioxide emissions and about 41% of methane emissions. And you can see that in the, in the figures behind me, you can see that for carbon dioxide, these small ponds that had been previously excluded are at the same level, same order of magnitude as the rest of the size classes. And for methane, they're much higher, a much greater contribution. We also looked at the ratio of methane to CO2, and methane um, is, a, is a much, well, it's about equal, the methane and CO2 coming out of small ponds versus large lakes that are contributing much more CO2 relative to methane. And so the take-home message is that these small ponds have a disproportionately large role in our carbon emissions. And so when we think back to these small ponds that are dotting the landscape around the world, and we, we know that they're important to biodiversity, but now we can think back to Raymond Lindemann's food cycle and this ooze. And not only is this ooze important to food web dynamics, uh, as Lindemann showed, he knew his organisms really well, uh, but he was also thinking that this ooze would be important to other cycling in these systems. And um, I think that we can now say that we know this ooze is also important to extremely high uh, carbon emissions to the atmosphere. <laughs> 
So small ponds do play this large role in the global carbon cycle from inland waters, um, although they have been ignored for some of the uncertainty just in their global distribution, as well as uncertainty in their greenhouse gas concentrations. So there's a call to action, uh, both to get improved technologies that can estimate the no total number of ponds around the world, as well as to do more field studies to measure these greenhouse gas concentrations. And it's been great to see some studies this week um, that are coming out that have been looking in, in small ponds and have been presented upon this week. And since I have you here, um, if I've convinced you that ponds are really important and you want to study them or you already are studying them, uh, I am working uh, or helping to lead a working group that stemmed through Gleon that's looking at ponds around the world. And we have a couple of different projects and one of them is looking at carbon dioxide and methane emissions in ponds around the world. So do get in touch with me if you want to join that project. Um, and I want to Thank many people. Um, thank you to the ASLO Awards Committee for this award. Obviously, a huge thanks goes to Pete. This project would not have been possible without him. Uh, my PhD advisor is Dave Skelly, uh, and both him and Angela Strecker, my PhD or postdoc mentor, uh, nominated me for this award. And <laughs> you may have seen me with a baby this week. I want to thank my mom, who's in the back holding my two and a half month old, and my husband, who's at home watching the rambunctious toddler. Uh, and with that, I'd love to answer any questions. I think I have a few minutes.